Right. Uh, thank you, Peter, for that very kind introduction. Um, yes, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be here. I mean, it's uh, the, one of those uh, legendary places that one hears about all the time but uh, never visits. So I'm very happy that I have a ch chance to uh, actually give a talk here. Uh, let me change my glasses. I'm getting old. Right, so the, you see the book uh, in front of you. I mean, the book arguably has uh, the weirdest uh, title in the history of economics. Um, now, a lot of people have asked me why 23 things. Actually, a cottage industry has uh, developed around uh, guessing why 23. So one well, at least in the initial period, uh, the one prominent theory was that I'm a big fan of Michael Jordan. <laughs> I mean, you all know Michael Jordan, you know. But uh, actually, I'm a very big fan of baseball, but I don't watch basketball. So even though I have known who Michael Jordan is, I didn't realize that his number is uh, 23. Others uh, the, the went uh, to the more esoteric shores of uh, our knowledge. Uh, the, apparently, in numerology, there is this uh, theory which uh, is called the 23 enigma, which claims exactly how, I don't know, that uh, all significant events in human society are somehow connected to number 23. So. There was that uh, famous uh, the book, uh, the, the series of novels, which I, of course, haven't read, called the Illumita <coughs> Illuminatus uh, Trilogy. And also, the, apparently, there was this uh, movie uh, with uh, Jim Carrey called uh, The Number 23. Now, I don't know how this uh, theory works, and I've never heard of it before people pointed this out to me. And some people had very charitable view of uh, me and thought I was so learned uh, that I was uh, implicitly referring to the so-called 23 mathematical problems proposed by the great German mathematician David Hilbert in the early 20th century. I've never heard of the guy, so it, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it is a theory while if I said was true, it would uh, put me in a very favorable light. I mean, that uh, it has nothing to do with the title. Actually, I mean, I can tell you exactly how the number came up, uh, uh, but then I worry that uh, you might be all get, uh, uh, might all get uh, disappointed uh, by the story. Well, 23 actually is a random number. How it came about was, uh, you know, the working title was uh, 20 things, yeah? And uh, one day, I mean, I still remember that uh, exactly where it happened. Uh, you know, there's uh, this uh, station called Paddington Station in London, you know, the Paddington Bear, you know, Agatha Christie's 450 from Paddington. I mean, it's a famous location. And I was uh, sitting in this uh, French uh, cafe called uh, Paul, Patisserie Paul, with my literary agent, this Irish guy, Ivan Mulcahy. And we are talking about this and that. And suddenly we looked at each other and said, 20, that's a bit boring, isn't it? Yeah? So we started uh, playing with the numbers. And I said, look, I, mean, I could probably write, I don't know, 30 things, 32 things or whatever. But that didn't make the book too big. So why don't we start at 25? Yeah? And then we thought 25 is a bit obvious. I told him I don't like even numbers. <laughs> 21, well, too close to 20. Yeah? So that left uh, 23, and the title was born. Yeah? <laughs> now, yeah, I know it's, that sounds a bit bizarre, doesn't it? I mean, it <laughs> sounds a bit like a sketch in Monty Python, maybe. Actually, that, I mean, that it is a, in a way, that, that, uh, story that I, you know, I tell you this story because uh, it is in a way representative of the spirit with which uh, the book was written, you know, I mean, uh, it, my, this 
American publisher Bloomsbury USA in his catalog described this book as a light-hearted book with a serious purpose. Eh? So in the same playful way in which uh, that we c came up with the title, book, the book uh, that has a lot of uh, kind of jokes and uh, kind of, uh, satire and uh, things like that, to the extent that uh, one of the reviewers that uh, described the book as John Maynard Keynes's general theory rewritten by the surrealist Argentinian novelist uh, Borges. <laughs> well, actually, the reviewer uh, meant it as a criticism, but I took it as a the, the, um, praise because, you know, I, I love uh, Borges. And uh, it's exactly the kind of the, the <laughs> description that, that I uh, wanted to get attached to the book. I mean, it is an economics book, but it's unusual, it's uh, interesting sometimes bizarre. So let me uh, tell you a few things about uh, this book. The book uh, will basically tell you that a lot of things that you thought you knew about capitalism are at best partial truth and at worst downright myth. Yeah? Now the, in the book, uh, the chapters are called things. Yeah, So thing one, thing two, and thing three, that, that, that in the footsteps of uh, the Dr. Seuss. Do you remember Cat in the Hat? With thing one and thing two, he had only two things, but I have 23 of them. Huh? <laughs> so thing one says that there is no such thing as a free market. Now, a lot of you might be puzzled by it. You know, I mean, you might say, OK, I mean, we may like or dislike uh, the free market, but I mean, how uh, how can you say that we are liking or disliking something that doesn't exist? Yeah, I mean, you know, it may be difficult to kind of scientifically define the free market, but we know it uh, when we see one. Yeah, in the same way that that uh, it's very difficult to define an elephant, but uh, you know it uh, when you see it. Huh? But I put to you that actually we cannot. <clears throat> tell whether a market is uh, truly free or not in any objective way. Let me give you an example. Back in 1819, a new law was uh, proposed to regulate child labor in the British Parliament. Huh? Now, the proposed law was incredibly weak by modern standards. So he said, well, very young children shouldn't work. Now, how young is very young? Any guess? Well, uh, you know, they were not that heartless. I mean, uh, they, they said, <laughs> yeah, uh, the below eight, yeah, children cannot work, but uh, from nine, they can, yeah? And then they said that uh, between nine and 16, uh, they would be allowed to work, but their working hours should be restricted. Any guess? That's right, 12 a day, yeah? Yeah, that was uh, considered being soft, yeah? <laughs> so that, that you would uh, find this uh, that, uh, regulation quite uh, absurdly light, you know, uh, especially given that this law was supposed to apply only to cotton factories, which are considered exceptionally harmful for children's health, yeah? Because it creates a lot of dust, dust uh, settle in the lungs, a lot of uh, children working in cotton factories that uh, died of lung disease, yeah? Anyway, uh, so uh, there was this uh, very yeah, light touch regulation, but a lot of people couldn't even take it, yeah? A lot of people argue, look, I mean, this is uh, uh, such a fundamental affrontery to the principle of freedom of contract, which is at the foundation of a free economy, yeah? You know, these children want to work, these people want to employ them. What is your problem? Hmm? Few people today, even including the most enthusiastic supporters of free market, at least in the rich countries, would argue that we need to bring back child labor in order to truly free our labor market. Huh? 